Abir Ahmed Choudhury is an independent consultant in the international development sector with a background in economics and development. Now, you might wonder why I have him on a podcast that is about creators and creativity. That's because Abir is my co-founder in Plantic. For those who don't know, Plantic is a football media company that we've been running for over a decade now. And over the years, we've done some pretty cool things in the world of football. For instance, we just launched a book a month ago and we regularly cater to millions of football fans online. All in all, I thought it would be great to have Abir on the show and really go through what it takes to build a media company together. So in this episode, we sit down and we talk about what it takes to run a social media first content entity that too remotely. We also discuss the evolution of media and content content that we've seen over the years and how we've been doing this thing for so long. Just to note that this podcast was recorded in early 2022 and the artwork in the animation was done by the talented Ahmed Fahim. All right, without further ado, here is season three of State of the Creators featuring Abir Ahmed Chaudhuri. Hope you enjoy the show. This is State of the Creators, a show about creative individuals who are on a quest to build something out of nothing. A lot of the things um, that we have in common uh, is based around football, right? And the fact that we build something together from the ground up. I and mean, we go way back uh, as colleagues, uh, as, as friends. Um, but for those who don't know who Abir Ahmed Chaudhary is, um, who is Abir Ahmed Chaudhary? I I think for a lot of the people watching this, they they might know me from Plantig, uh, where which I I co-founded with you and and Arni and and Majid Bhai back in 2011. Uh, but but besides that, I wear you know, I wear quite a few hats. Um, to to a large section of people, they are not aware of you know anything I do with Plantig. For them, I am someone you know working in the international development sector. I spent the last seven years you know working in development in Bangladesh. So so. I think for me, those would be the, the two main identities that, uh, you know, most people would uh, associate me with. Now, I'm going to straight go into the conversation here, right? Like, like for, for a bit of context, we started this thing, what, 10 years, 10 years ago, right? Um, or more than 10 now, um, with, as you mentioned, with, with a few other co-founders who are, uh, who've kind of moved on since then. So it's basically you and two, just the two of us are, uh, are the only kind of remnants of the, of the initial OG crew, but going into the idea of you being part of this, were you ever part of anything similar prior to Plantic? So did you, you know, I know you're quite introverted, uh, as, as I've learned uh, over the last 10 years in certain circumstances at the very least, but prior to this, um, were you involved in, I don't know, writing or, or creating things at school or, or anything of that sort? I think Plantic has led me to this sort of journey of from being an introvert to, to this process of extroversion. So I think I would fall more on the extroversion spectrum uh, right now. But but no, actually, before co-founding Plantic, I was, you know, I back in school, I was a nerd, you know, mostly focused on getting good grades, not really too much into extracurriculars. Mm -hmm was interested in football, but mostly, you know, as, as a spectator, not really, you know, I was, I wasn't too much into playing football. After my O levels, um, I did a few, you know, football blog writing here and there, but again, you know, nothing, you know, nothing, nothing on a massive scale. I used to follow a lot of football bloggers and journalists on Twitter. And, uh, you know, I was, I was, I started using Twitter, I think from 2010. So mm. I was, I could say part of the OG, OG. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter crowd in Bangladesh. And uh, that got me thinking that, you know, there was so much content on, on football and the whole ecosystem, the landscape was so different back in 2010. I thought that uh, not a lot of people knew what was happening. We could present football to, to the Bangladeshi audience in a way that they're not aware of at the moment. And that got me thinking that, you know, maybe we could create a website or social media wasn't, you know, football pages back then were not really a thing. Reddit was popular. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure if you remember this, but football forums, you know, there were plenty of forums yeah, similar yeah. to Reddit. Yeah, yeah. They were massive. So, so websites were a big thing. And then on, uh, on these websites, you had these forums where people were having basically how football Facebook groups run these days. Yeah. 
it was it was the same thing back then so those actually that was a major inspiration uh, and and i thought that maybe we could replicate replicate something like that for the bangladeshi audience yeah, it's funny you bring that the forums up because uh you know one of the the ex, well, one of the co-founders uh majid uh he was part of the underground football and he, and i remember underground football had its own forum um, and this is all prior to Plantic as well, where, you know, anybody who doesn't don't know what underground football is, basically a very wide community of uh, teen footballers at the time. Um, and these forums were like the central hub for discussing after a tournament or a game. So it, it kind of was yeah. Facebook before Facebook for a lot of us. So it's it's very true how, how big the forums were. But um, actually, my next question was, you know, what prompted you to make Plantic? And, and I think uh, it kind of answered it. But the one interesting thing you mentioned was that you were part of the Twitter, OG Twitter crowd in, in 2010, you know, back when people didn't even know Facebook as, as much. So what was it about Twitter that attracted you at that time? Uh, was there anything specific um, that, that drew you in? Uh, no, so I was reading on on different football websites that they were sharing tweets from from footballers and also cricketers were quite big at, at that time too. And I remember, I think um, back during the 2010 World Cup, so Rio Ferdinand was one of the first people to to be active on Twitter. And Rooney, and, you know, where and, he and asked, they used to do, <laughs> asked you to pick him up for a training. Yeah, and they used to do competitions where, you know, if you could answer a quiz question right. or if you, you know, retweeted something, you would get, um, I think you won an Amro shirt. Uh, yeah, for, sometime from a different, from a different, yeah, for, with, yeah, with England, actually. Yes, I did. That's right. That's right. So it was a very selfish reason to be active on Twitter because there, were, there was not a lot of people using it. So it was a lot easier now these days oh, it's when you ask. Yeah, I remember when, you, yeah, when, when a celebrity good. says re retweet something and you get like a million yeah. retweets and you've got you know, almost a 0% yeah. chance yeah. of winning. Yeah. But back then you had a legit exactly. shot. So exactly. I think that and also the, 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 the major attraction for me was that... Uh, that the removal of that barrier, right? You could directly interact with athletes. I knew that those accounts were not being run by third party exactly. marketing agents. I had, um, I had, a, <laughs> I think a few Twitter exchanges with uh, Kevin Davis. You remember the, yes. the former Bolton yes. striker? And, and I so, remember so, having one with um, Giuseppe Rossi um, as well. Uh, obviously now, as you mentioned, like they're all run by media companies or uh, separate social media manager but back then uh, so true um so 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 you got into twitter and you saw there was this big kind of um uh, explosion of of bloggers and football journalists and that prompted you to to get into into building something or at least um having something similar uh in in the country um what was the first step in your head like 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 was it more from the perspective of if this is something i want to do out of passion or or something that you knew from the get-go that I want to build this into something bigger than just a blog, for example. Um, no, definitely, it, it it was a passion project, and uh, you know, just to 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 give further context, um, as I said, you know, in my school years, you know, when I was doing O levels, A levels, I wasn't really too involved with you know any extracurricular stuff. I didn't really have a wide network to to lean on for advice or the kind of mentorship. Mm -hmm you know, support mechanism that you can have access to these days. Uh, those things were not there. I did not have a lot of seniors to, to go to, let's say, for you know, getting advice, bouncing off ideas. And so so there were two streams to that. One was, of course, this passion and uh, having seen the, the opportunity on Twitter and, and football blogs and websites, there was that angle to it. But, but in addition to that, I, I, I think that I also felt that I wanted to do something on my own and just to, you could say, I guess I was, I had that problem, I guess most teenagers do of, you know, lack of self-esteem in a way, lack of self-confidence. I felt that I needed to do something. I needed to have something, you know, of my own. And uh, that was, I, I, you know, that was, you know, another motivation for that. Going from there, obviously after 10 years of, of, reiterating a lot of the things that we started from uh, you know from writing articles to uh, making posters to running a, a, I, w I wouldn't say a full-on media company but it's a quote-unquote media company would you classify yourself as a, as a creator in, in any capacity um i i i wouldn't because i hold creators in in a like in in very high regard and i feel like it's it's more of a, 
uh, not really divine, but I think it's a special craft that I don't think I have the expertise of yet. I would say I'm more of a, a, a doer, an implementer, a, a manager kind of kind of an individual rather than a creator. But, but you, you, I, can, I would say you've had, you know, you, you, you have shown a lot of uh, you know, elements of, of being a creator throughout, throughout the years as well. And, and, um, and that's why I asked the question, like, did you have anything prior to, to planting that, that would have enforced it? Do you think it was more of you being kind of part of the ecosystem that drove those ideas here and there? Uh, even though you don't classify yourself as a creator, you, you came up with some creative ideas. Definitely. I think, uh, one was of this, this constant, uh, curiosity that I had. And this constant urge of, of figuring out how to do, do things on my own because you know at the start i said because there was no support mechanism around me remember how i used to go to you for graphic designing <laughs> advice uh, every couple of days and i'm like still crap at it but the, those little exactly. things i felt that i had to do it on my own you know i was watching youtube tutorials on how to run facebook mm -hmm. pages how to do you know digital media marketing how to do graphic design how to do video editing uh, you know, how to, how to run a community, for example. So, so these things were, because we were confined to, it was just the four of us running it. Yeah. Right. So we, uh, we didn't really, we weren't really at the stage where we could, uh, you know, we were, we had other external support. Um, it was, the onus was on me to, to figure out how to do, how to do those things and then learn things on my own. So, so through, you know, you're, you were obviously an econ major. Um, to the university, and then you went on to development studies and, and do consulting now in the, in the same space. How much of your expertise or or learnings from that aspect of your life has has helped on the planting side of things, if any? I would say massively, especially now, and then I wouldn't relate it directly to development, but more so on the professional sort of uh, grooming perspective. So I think when you operate in 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 a, in a professional world, there are many people management, for example, that's something I feel that I've gotten a lot better at, uh, by being, you know, by working in a nine to five setting, um, you, you kind of undervalue, you know, especially when you're in that creator mindset, uh, you, you undervalue the importance of, you know, relationships and managing people and how important they are, uh, how important teamwork is and team, the team dynamics are. Second point, I would say having a more big picture perspective. Uh, you know, how do you keep your emotions aside and then, you know, think long term as opposed to getting excited about, you know, small opportunities that are, you know, you know right, you know, on the, on the horizon uh, and then like kind I, of I having like a that's more... a personal attack, but go on. <laughs> no, I think having a, being pragmatic, right? Being, uh, uh, knowing that, <laughs> not, not jumping into every single opportunity and then also running a company. I think there are many, um, many subtleties, many nuances that you need to be you know, aware of. And uh, being that, being that, that um, knowing that they are ultimately the buck stops with you. So having that leadership perspective as well, that no matter what happens, you know, person X can screw up, you know, maybe somewhere on Facebook, but eventually, because we are responsible, the buck stops with yeah. us and we have to you know, come up with an explanation and we have to deal yeah. with it. Um, and I'm going to flip the question now, how much of, do you think being involved with planting has helped you in your other side of the career, uh, you know, professional life. Massively. So, so actually, uh, my, my first job in the development sector was in communications. And so after I had graduated, I, I really wanted to get into the development sector, but it's so hard to, to get your foot in the door. So I used to cold email managers from, from different organizations and tell them that, look, I run this community. I, I helped this brand grow and get to a following of, you know, X number of people. I have expertise on social media. Look at these events that we have done. And uh, these were all like cold emails, uh, people that I had identified who could, you know, maybe help me with jobs. And then one of those emails, I remember my first boss, uh, saw that email and then reached out to me saying, hey, you know, are you free for a chat? I would like to learn more about you. And that led to my first job, which was in communications. Mm -hmm. So I basically leveraged planting. Without planting, I don't think I would have gotten that job. So, so massively. And, and then of course, I think that, uh, that multifaceted skill set that you develop 
that I developed in the first five, six years of Planty was a, was a massive advantage as well. You know, little things like, uh, as I said, running a social, uh, running a social media page, running a website, uh, knowing editing, knowing designing, having that sense of aesthetics, knowing what, you know, I think these are things that you don't really talk a lot about, but uh, these are like, these come up in the day-to-day -day work um, here and there. And I think that is always an advantage when you've gone through the whole process. Dude, I, I completely agree, right? Because for me as well, I think first, my first job, again, I don't think I would have gotten it if, if it wasn't for the Plantic website that we made back, back then. Um, I remember distinctly that I went in and, and, it, and, and my, you know, professional life is actually more in tune with what I do in the media and content world, right? Because I'm a marketing consultant. So, uh, at least now I'm a consultant, but back then I was as a marketing exec or marketing, you know, operating office or anything of that sort. So for those kind of lower roles, um, they needed someone to be able to, you know, manage social media, handle communications and things of that sort. So. I remember they they wanted to see my work, and um, prior to that, this was my only thing that I could show off proudly. And look, I've done this, I've built this, I've made this website out of, out of you know from from scratch, and um, that just impressed um, the agency with whom I had applied for the role. And they, I still remember specifically in the interview room, they went in and they were like, "Oh, uh, the planting dot com is the one that you mean?" Like, "Yep, that's the one." They put it up on the screen. Um, and I got the job, right? And I think um, same thing, like if it wasn't for Planty, I don't think I would have gotten the job. And in a lot of ways, when you kind of look back now in the five, six years of your career, it almost feels like it, it kind of led one thing to another, to one thing to another, and one thing to another, to where you are right now. So in a lot of ways, if it wasn't for Planty, it probably would be a completely different route for me, good or bad, that's a separate issue, but I think, it, at least for me, it's, it's had a huge, I owe pretty much my entire career to Plantic's uh, early days for sure. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think like I didn't have it all charted out when, when I started, but uh, every single step in the whole process was important. You can jump from you know A to Z. You know, you've got to go through all the letters in between. And I think now I realize the importance of, uh, you know, grinding it out at the start and, and, and you know, those uh the, the time that i spend learning new skills i think those were so critical at the start i mean a lot of people actually dislike the whole idea of learning on the job and, and granted we didn't i mean ours wasn't a job job when we started planting but um uh, which kind of gave us a little bit of freedom to to mess up but uh, it does seem like we had to learn a lot on the job like my my earliest days of uh, graphic designing that I did for Planty was on Microsoft Paint. And it was within that first few years where when I learned um, how to use Photoshop because I had to and I had to match up with whatever's out there. I'm gonna shift um, the gear a little bit here and bring the topic more so about being a co-founder, right? Um, what has, you know, first of all, how challenging has it been to be a co-founder? You know, somehow the four of us at the start, even though we did not really know each other that well, or, you know, for some people know each other at all, um, we managed to, to make it work because all of us had, like, we brought different things to the table. Um, and that happened, I don't think it was by design, it was by accident that we were able to bring different things to the table. We had different kinds of you know, expertise. Oh, and uh, I think that was, that is why the, the relationships worked at the start. So we were not really, you know, uh, getting into each other's lanes. And, and even though we were you know, young, we were teenagers, I think there was, there was mutual respect for each other's, you know, uh, individual skill set and expertise. Mm -hmm. So for example, I would never bother about design stuff. Right, because I knew that you were the expert. So if you said this is good to go, this is great. You know, I would defer to you. No, no questions asked, no comments. What I would do instead was learn from you on why design X is better than design Y. Understand the mechanics of it. Uh, why you know why does something look better than the other? So kind of use that opportunity to learn from you. And I think the others did the same as well. Over time, you, I think. When we started out planting, we did not really think it was going to become what it is now. So over time, what happened was people's expectations went up. We felt that we had to restructure a little bit to 
keep keep up with those expectations we couldn't really and it's it's with like any other business you can't stick to status quo and and maintain your position in the market per se so i think when when those things were happening the the relationships were starting to become you know more difficult to manage and i think again you know i go back to my previous point had had i been in those conversations now i would have been able to handle them much much better because uh, again i think there there is a time when you need to be diplomatic but again there's a time when you need to be just blunt in, in a respectful manner but i i didn't i don't think i had the skill set back then and which led to sometimes you know i, I remember we didn't speak I, i'm not sure if you remember this we didn't speak for a few months back in 2015 we had a we had an argument and uh, and now when i look back that it, that was so childish and immature of me had that happened had that conversation took place now we would have you know handled it like adults and uh, moved on in the grand scheme of things there was a nothing topic so i think these little things uh, you again it's a, it's it's a learning process you learn with time and i guess uh, when you're young as well you're not as uh, forgiving as you are right now so you think every single thing matters more than it really does and uh, you're like more emotional about every single thing yeah i do remember uh, uh that 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 part and i think plantic also suffered because of that that one point because i think there were moments you know obviously it was the first few years it was just the four of us and then it was the three of us and then it was just the two of us for a few good years uh, i would say at least two, three of us for a few good years and i think there was this one point where it was just the one of us kind of holding fort almost in cycles. So I would hold fort like a few months and then you'd hold for yeah. you know the couple and then I'd hold for and it almost felt like we were we were really really going going crazy. And I think it was also because we didn't have each other's backs. Um it almost became like you know, it, it's not our thing, it's my versus your thing. Um yeah. and in, in a lot of ways uh, yeah, I've mentioned this in the past as well. Uh, you know, co-founding a company is pretty much like being in, in a marriage, like like in a, in a relationship. And and uh, yeah. at, at one point, we did speak to each other more so than we did to our significant others. Because back then, remember, you could check um, how many messages, the, the number of messages exchanged, <laughs> exchanged on, on Facebook Messenger. And I remember too too many to to share I with know, your I audience. Know, I know. Between us, it was uh, <laughs> the highest, and then at my significant others, who was who was dating at the time. Um, was second to yours, and that showed, I guess, the amount of work that goes into something. You know, when you you know build something, right? And and um, the the challenging part for me was also kind of being being grounded in in, in a in a longer term vision. I, I don't know if you remember, but I, I was always trying to look ahead like three, four, five years at a time. Like I would right. hold like PowerPoint presentations that nobody would nobody would read or or, or understand at the time. But I think um but, but see see this is where I have changed. Now if you if you did all that, I would be like uh, you know loving every single minute of it. Because now I want things to be presented yeah. to me in that manner. I understand the importance of, of you know why those things are required, why there's a need to be organized, structured. If you you know, it's all part of being serious about what you do. But back then as well, I think another thing to 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 share with your audience is, I was also you know I just started yeah. working as well. So when you, yeah. I had trans you know I graduated, university yes. life was very different. I could stay up until midnight or you know even until three or four o'clock, watch all the games, cover all the games. But then when nine to five happened, life changed completely. And then I was you know you know going out of Dhaka, doing a bunch of field visits, and my whole sort of lifestyle changed. And uh, that became, you know, it became more and more difficult to cover games, to be, you know, up to speed on, on what's happening on the football world. And that transition, I feel that the whole, you know, the, the issues with you, the structural changes, they all kind of happen mm -hmm. around the same period because we were all, you had graduated, I had graduated, you know, or Arani was living, a, yeah, moved, I think, moved to, to a different country. Uh, the, you know, Majid Bhai was, uh, I think he moved to, to a new country as well. So, so everyone was going through mm. major life changes. And at that point, you know, I legit, I genuinely thought that, uh, we were going to shut down. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's been more than one moment where we felt that it's time, time to quit. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that we're going to be around for the next 10 years, even though it would be nice to build it into something, but over the last 
get yeah you know ever since we started i think there were at least i can think of two or three you know moments where we thought that you know this is it like i, I don't think we, we we can continue so so yeah you're right yeah no ab- absolutely i think um, there's always like that uh like you're at a crossroads every few years uh where you're, you're like you don't know what's going to happen next i remember like when you were getting married as well again major life change would you be able to devote you know as much time to plantic as you were doing previously um so so i think whatever mm-hmm. challenges that we have had we've been able to to navigate around them but you know when we look back mm-hmm. as i said i think with more yeah but and, and a lot of those were actually the lowest points in our you know creator career with plantic as well like i remember i would actually be be frustrated at times if if things weren't working out but now that you know we've kind of gone past that and we still go through those phases every now and then as early as last year as well right so why do you think we we still stuck out yeah, and and I, i'm not trying to say that you know we are as big as bleacher report or anything of that sort or but but we we still have a following we still have people who who are you know kind enough to work with us um on a day-to-day basis um who feel part of this of this journey like like why do you think that's still the case i think uh yeah no, no i think that the, the you know very simple answer i think the main point that people you know when they when they Uh, ideate or when they think of new ideas is the um undervalue the importance of having a community i think when when we look at plantic it's not really a, a, you know i i don't like it when people call it a page it's not a website i think it's the the community angle of it that really is is the drives the entire you know engagement that we see mm-hmm. people you know visiting the page on a regular basis whether they like it or not this sort of um almost like this sense of belonging you know this is a place where they have uh, you know like minded people in terms of the the interest in football uh, whether you know whether they are people whether they're lurkers out on the page reading comments on a regular basis or whether they're interacting i think what we've been able to do is uh, through our posts and what we're trying to focus more and more uh, on in the, in the in the you know going forward is have like almost a self sustaining kind of mechanism where our job is only to to create that space for people to engage in conversations and active debates and our job is to sit back and make sure that okay if there's something unpleasant going on we will you know intervene and make sure that those things are not happening and if you know and steer the conversation in the in a, in a different kind of direction but the, the rest is up to the individuals because when you think of it had there been no engagement at all we probably would have you know packed our bags and and done something different a long time back but i think it's this community that we have been built and we have been able to to uh, make sure that they are you know still engaged they're still involved um certain offline events competitions stuff like that videos having a variety of ways through which we are reaching out to them i think that's been really i think to to, to if i had to distill everything down to just one core reason that would be it as you we just mentioned like there were moments where we wanted to walk away um i know why i kept coming back why did you keep coming back i think you know again um, there the two angles to it one is a very selfish angle of of this fear of of uh, not you know having like a f- having fomo when you know if or when uh, plantic let's say let's say you know i decide to leave and plantic is still mm-hmm. around you know i didn't because i was so emotionally invested in it i didn't want to run the risk of of losing it all and and kind of regretting it later on so my philosophy has always been if there's a way if there's you know even like a 1% chance of me being involved in making it work i want to to give the effort and see where it takes me instead of just saying okay it's now maybe it's time to go and 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 yeah losing everything that we've we've uh yeah. built for for the last 10 plus years so so there, there's definitely that selfish and emotional angle but also at the same time i think there's that there's the market angle as well uh, there are there's there's not a lot of communities that have been able to stand you know the test of time in the, in, in the digital sense and what i mean by that is if you look at pages communities that uh, you know have come up in the last 10 plus years it's not easy to to sustain for such a long period mm-hmm. of time so there is and as as i said it goes back to the whole community angle to it because we've been able to build that there is a certain expectation from our fans we know that there's a way we can make it work 
there's a lot of learning insights that uh, you know market research and uh, and then you know fancy studies are not going to get you. Having interacted with people yeah. day in day out for so many years, you get the kind of insights that. Um, you're not going to get elsewhere. And I think having seen that, having seen the opportunity and having seen the ecosystem evolve and grow, and then we know that there are more opportunities in this space. Um, I think that that is a major motivation for us to keep going because uh, 10 years later, I'm just surprised, you know, that uh, there's not another community like ours uh, in, 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 in you know, the Bangladesh context because you see younger kids do so many creative things, so many interesting things. Yeah. So I'm just surprised that no one's really, there have been a few initiatives here and there, and there are other initiatives yeah. you know, around football, and they're great. But similar to Plantic, I'm just surprised that nothing else has come up. Yeah, because the ones that are kind of still standing the test of time and audience and sustainability are, are still not football focused. They are sports right. focused. Uh, which obviously works in advantage in some ways, uh, but yeah, you're right. I, I also don't know why there haven't been many um, similar, you know, communities that like. And in fact, we 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 would love to see that because I think that's also a sign of of a floor, you know, a, a flourishing ecosystem. But um, but yeah, I think one other thing is you know, despite all of all of the you know, quote unquote successes we've we've had. Um, I think you and I both, you know, agree, and we've spoken about this a lot, a lot over the years, is that we had a vision of success in our in our minds, and we both agree that we haven't fulfilled that potential um, yet, uh, to to say the least. Um, why do you think that's the case? I think so. Again, the, the definition of success keeps changing for us. So when, again, in you know, back in 2011, if you had told me that 10 years later, we would be where we are right now, I would have taken it, you know, in, in a heartbeat. But then as we evolved, as things kept growing, and as we kept seeing more and more opportunities, I just felt that because of our time limitations, because of the fact that we were doing other things, because it took us a while to restructure as well, to understand that uh, it was... Yeah, it was great what we were doing at the time, but then having that long-term vision as well, which came to us much later, because we were young at the time. As I said, if I had, you know, if we had the the ecosystem that we have right now, around you know mentorship and uh, you know these accelerator programs or whatever you call them, I think our story would have been significantly different. But then we were we didn't have that support back then, so I feel mm -hmm. that um, the, the major limitations are I I don't think we've gone all in. And uh, that's a that's a that's a question we ask ourselves, you know, on a, on a regular basis. And it's a funny funny thing because you know, the, my last question is, was was why do you think we have been able to sustain such a long period of time? And I think part of the answer is because we didn't go all in. Uh, I feel that way because if this was a full time thing, and if you were looking to scale up every single day, like you know, like like scale, 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 do this, do that, do this, do that. I think. Um, a lot of media companies have suffered, you know, even internationally. You look at BuzzFeed, and and um, uh, even in in the country, you know, as, as um, latest as, as Deco or other similar kind of um, portals or media companies who have had funding, who have had this huge uptake right. of of virality and and building a quick community, have almost you know as quickly faded away uh, in, in, in a lot of cases. So uh, I feel that that. Perhaps it's it's also a, a blessing um, that we haven't gone all in, but at the same because because what I think the hardest part is, is maintaining that community, right? Maintaining that audience level, um, and we've been just solely able to focus on that without having to look at charts and numbers and Excel sheets on the day in day out. We've just been focused on giving value to the to the community, and I think that's why we've been able to build and, and, and more importantly, hold on to them. Speaking of audiences, um, you, know, you know, we do talk a lot about audiences. Uh, do you think um, our audience is smarter than us? I, I genuinely think so. I think I'm constantly surprised by, well, these days, let's say I'm not as, you know, I'm as in touch with football as I used to be. But even like five, six years yeah. back, I used to be taken back. So back then I had this ego that I was, you know, 
I had all the football information that that you could find on the internet, right? And then, uh, you know, every now and then I used to come across these individuals, some people on our food Facebook team as well, who could do things, you know, so differently and so much more efficiently than, than, than yeah. we had been doing. And then you're like constantly, you're like, uh, that's a that's a reality check and a humbling experience for you that you think, you always think that mm-hmm. you, you, you know, you think that you know more than you actually do. No, and and I think um, you're right in a lot of in, in a lot of ways, but at the same time, um, you also mentioned something ages back. Uh, it's about you know, as creators, when we publish something, we need to be ready to face whatever you know abuse that come our way. Um, what made you come to the conclusion? Uh, no, so uh, I think it's just that the way the internet. Uh, system has evolved. You know, I think these days mm. it's so easy to to voice your opinions, and and football being such a sensitive topic, right? Uh, naturally, there's this tendency to, if, you know, if there's a post about about your team that you don't agree with, you jump to conclusions that there is, you know, a broader ag- agenda that this page mm. has, and then uh, then you react based on that. And I think you you look at Twitter as well. I think uh, when you look at Plantic, sometimes people give Bangladeshi crowd a hard time. But it's voice out on Twitter. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. After a game, look at the the replies that athletes get. Uh, I think it's it's uh, what we see on planting is a microcosm of the of, of a broader you know issue with with the internet, and and you could even argue a broader issue with the society as well. And um, and because football being such a you know such a sensitive topic, I just don't think there's any right formula. No matter how you post, what you post you're always going to get hate and abuse but but the important thing to keep in mind here is uh, you know being i guess adhering to your own philosophy all the time if you know that there's a right way of posting you everyone's got their own kind of guidelines policies style etc you have a vision you have a style you have a philosophy you have a structure you stick to it and then you don't really worry about you know what the the abuse is going to be like but at the same time you pay attention you look at the feedback, but you take in what makes sense, and then the rest of it you stay firm on where you are. With a lot of the the criticism that Plantic gets is is being biased and and things of that sort. And and while uh, some of it may may be you know considered as as um, appropriate or or making sense, uh, a lot of it does sometimes, uh, at least on a personal level, feel. Um, unfair um do, do you feel the same when you see some of these these comments coming coming you know like targeted at, at planting and planting admins or or uh things of that sort i i think it's massively unfair but i can also understand where they're coming from so here's the thing i think what we see is uh, when we go to the page we see every single post that we are making right but we also have to consider that from a you know, from from that person's perspective who's criticizing us, they are only seeing what is provided, what they come across on their newsfeed. And they're not really seeing, let's say, all the posts that we are making. They're only seeing the ones that probably they don't agree with. And then they come, they, they really, there's the whole confirmation bias angle to it. I think it's unfortunate because, you know, I can at no point, and then you and I both know this, that they... <laughs> By being biased, it's not going to add any value to what we are trying to do. If, if any, you know, it, it is going to hamper the whole, uh, you know, the, the whole the reason why why planting exists. So there is no incentive for us or motivation for us to be biased. However, I understand that sometimes maybe uh, some certain captions could trigger certain emotions. Maybe there are inconsistencies when it comes to posting someone on the team. You know, forgot to post an update, and then that becomes a, a way to, you know, again confirmation bias because it's in yeah. their people's heads. It's in the people's heads that uh, their possibility, you know, there is a possibility of some bias against their own team, and then they see no post about their team. They, you know, they connect the dots and they feel like you know, these guys are biased. I'm not going to listen to them. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I'm totally, totally on board with you as well. I think sometimes it's just. Um, and I think that empathy has 
built within us uh, because of the last, you know, I think that longevity of being in that space. I think on the initial days, we just get triggered ourselves. Like, hey, uh, like, you know, we'd get really, we take it really personally. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I think we do see, and I, I didn't used to believe in the concept of haters, but I, I sometimes I do see some people coming back specifically, like, you know, like repeat kind of uh, trolling or yeah. repeat criticism. Like despite, um, I think one or two comments I think people can make because, as you mentioned, like it's just naturally on their feed, just the way it has come. They felt a certain way, and that's fine. But there are certain individuals who keep coming back only to to cause hate or or cause fire, and and that I just can't understand. Like like uh, like I said, I believe in haters. Like all the all the rap artists and hip hop artists would talk about, you know, shooting the haters and doing all that kind of stuff, and. Like I wouldn't get it. Like, oh, like who has time to hate on you, man? Like, like just relax. But I think over the ten years, I've finally seen that that happen. So no, I think some of the comments weird. that we see are just you know their intention is to stir the pot and uh, you know yeah. in the hope of of canceling us and <laughs> and and then it's the same mentality with with other pages, other communities, you know, celebrity yeah. accounts, um, accounts with large following. You see that I think that sort of mentality of ganging up on on you know. It's it's almost like these days it's important. You can't afford to slip up at all. I think it yeah. is the sad reality. Every single you know, yeah. Yeah. one small mistake, let's say you forget to post something, um, there is no way back for a lot of people. Fortunately, we mm -hmm. have a strong enough following to to recover, bounce back. It does not affect us. But think of had Plantic been you know we had we founded Plantic two three years ago, I don't think we would have been able to sus you know be around for so long. We kind of answered our own question there as to why we don't see a lot of new, similar kind of uh, communities building is because one of the things hard to break through that noise and the, you know building a community and making sure everything's all right, right? I think um, a lot of the times we have slipped up. Um, our community, even though there's like the ten percent or five percent of people who would hate on us, the rest ninety percent I've seen a lot of times actually step, you know, step up on like on our behalf yeah. and to defend us and, and talk nice things about us. And, and I think that for me, I think is the most rewarding thing is just seeing that they feel part of the community, uh, you know, enough to defend the community itself, which is, right. is brilliant. Well, well, one thing I'll also add here is, uh, you know, from the outset, we made sure that we elevated Plantic and not individuals associated with Plantic. And I think that was a the a major reason why we, I think when you see individuals, you you tend to associate their individual qualities with yes. the entity, even though they might not be related at all. And I see yeah. a lot of uh, you know younger crowd, younger people when they come up with these initiatives, there's a lot of focus on the individual yeah. rather than the entity. And I think maybe that is you know that is one angle, at least from our experience, it's worked. What do you think about making money in this space? And this is something you know we we have spoken about. Obviously, um, uh, you know we like, like how, how would you say how difficult would you say it is to to make money in this space um, as a you know quote unquote media company, um, especially based in Bangladesh. I think it's a. I mean, that's part of the reason why we we really haven't been able to go all in uh, because for us that, that that risk is still you know quite significant. Um, right now, so so the whole, in, in when I say like the whole ecosystem, and by that I mean, um, there are certain things that have come up in the in the last let's say few years that probably have made it easier for for people to make money through this mm -hmm. uh, through this space for example the the domestic football becoming more popular so now there's an opportunity for media agencies or or you know startups to become the the digital media partners social media partners or football clubs for example they can they can be the the the, the managers of the social media pages of footballers athletes both local and foreign i think that's mm -hmm. an avenue for example that did not really exist even a few years back you can there's an opportunity to to work closely with the football federation for example that's another way to make make money you get large contracts you know whether it's football training, setting up and setting up an academy, managing their page, helping them. You know, uh, with with digital operations, that is another angle. 
but but still if you kind of look at it at a macro level i don't think there are enough opportunities yet for 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 an entity to to really make significant mon money yet i think we're still quite a long way off mm -hmm. uh, but that is changing and i think as football becomes more and more popular um you know look at for example so i feel that the, the ones the entities that you see doing well on football if you analyze closely there's there's always that another sport that drives them and then it's usually cricket that uh, enables them to get access to the to to the, the major mass following mm -hmm. uh you look at you know t sports for example if t sports had been a, a football specific channel the the game the dynamics would have been very very different mm -hmm. and i think that the, that is where ultimately the challenge lies yeah. and there's a lot lot more money you know commercial value commercial interest in cricket and then people leverage that and football becomes a part of the equation but you can't i feel the ecosystem is not ready for you to manage a business profitably keeping football at the core of it right um no i, I agree i think it's it's again going back to the examples i mentioned is, is you know even the biggest media companies in the world are struggling to to feed themselves um because i think just the model i don't think anybody has completely cracked that that model except maybe Logan Roy <laughs> in the world of media, but, but um, <laughs> I had to he's be got, He's got other problems to worry about. <laughs> um, without giving in much, much spoilers of the show. Um, no, it, it, is, it is a difficult model to crack. And, and I think, again, uh, going back to my earlier answer, is that because we didn't go all in, we haven't had that much of financial risk, which would have put us out of the game if we, if we had. Um, which is why we've been able to sustain uh, to a degree. But I, I feel, you know, that the, the influencer model, uh, I think with, with media companies or, or even like entities like blogs or something like that, if, if they can look into the idea of, of an influencer model or, and, and then leveraging the community that they have. And, and recently we've done, um, you know, a collaboration with, with, with Guru Gaj for our 10 year anniversary, where we, you know, made a, made a 10 year anniversary of merchandise, um, very limited edition. Um, it, it was definitely one of the more successful campaigns that we have, we have done, uh, from financial level, from a, from a, a community level as well. Uh, granted it was a 10 year special, but I think that goes to show that, that if you've got the backing of a community that you've built and then gained trust from, um, eventually you would be able to, to leverage that, um, and hopefully sustain in the long run, but you have to provide value. And I think you know, we've looked at other models of membership models, like Patreon, we've looked at other models of, of, um, creating, uh, content that's very specific, uh, for, for a certain audience, which they can, you know, adding paywalls like the athletic, but I think from the Bangladeshi perspective, it feels like, uh, the the purchasing power for uh, an audience that's that's still on the younger you know university or, or or younger it's still very low to be able to do that compared to other countries. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then there's also the opportunity cost angle to it as well yeah. because even though we are operating in a in a Bangladesh specific context, we are are you no know, athletic is also doing what what we're doing in a way, but doing yeah. it much better at a much higher scale. So if you have got, let's say, a single pound that you want to spend, yeah. are you going to put it on planting or are you going to subscribe to the athletics? Yeah. Especially they have access to the actual journalists on the ground, exactly. exclusive access to the clubs and the, and the people. So exactly. So I think that's where, where the difficulty lies. But I think then you see other kind of entities like Tifo Football or, you know, like a lot of the Fantasy Premier League um, creators who have built huge following um, through through that kind of stuff. So, so it's not like there isn't ways. I think it's just finding that, that way of, of providing value. And I think we're still yet to crack that from an original content perspective because we've just been that, that middleman um, of providing a community rather than building content that the community uh, can get on a regular basis. Yeah, no, I think, I think for us, the, the, the happy medium would be the, the, the Facebook and the social media engagement of it combined with an active mm. uh, YouTube channel that is churning out original content on a regular basis. So you have this sort of two streams of audiences in a way with some overlap and then 
because without you can't really throw the Facebook community out of the window, even no. though, you know, specifically through Facebook, we're not really making a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, but, but, but that is the heart and soul of what we do, what we have. And I think it's how we utilize that, that traffic, that audience, that following to drive to other channels. And, and, you know, we've talked in the past about growing our YouTube channel. Uh, the, some of the pieces that you've come up with, you know, they've received great reception and that is a major, you know, that's something that, uh, I don't think we've explored fully yet, yeah. um, and, and we, which we'll plan to do in the in the you know in the next few months, amp up our original content, and and I think that is, you know, in my view, the best bet. One of the key things as to as to why we've been able to also kind of prolong, um, you know, our, our our game is because we were very adaptable as well. I think with Facebook and Twitter and or any other social media platforms the amount of times they have changed the algorithm or they've changed, uh, you know, they've buffed up something or nerfed something or certain pieces of content. I think for us to be able to adapt to that has been, has been the thing. And I think, uh, I think the one thing I'm very fearful of is losing the ability to adapt because of how frequently things are changing, how new players are coming to the game and doing things better. Um, obviously in the Bangladesh context, like, you know, a lot of new creators are, are coming in. It's great to see um, that they're, they're doing this kind of stuff, but uh, how well are we, uh, you know, capable of, of, of adapting to that, to that challenge is, is the question. No, no, absolutely. And I think um, that's where the whole, you know, being humble is, is so, so important. And uh, that's where the whole, you know, the, the, the point that I mentioned earlier, that mm. the audience is always smarter than you. Um, you might think you have the greatest piece of content out there. You have the greatest strategy that you can have. But then you are, you know, the moment you go out to public, you are, you're, you're in for a surprise. And, um, and it's interesting because we... Uh, we pay attention to pretty much every single thing that's yeah. out there you know, that's operating in this space. You know, we are like, they, they, they don't know, but we, we're like big followers of your work. Uh, we watch um, everything every that you put out, dissect yeah. every single thing. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, why, you know, the, the timing of the post, why did you interview this person at this time? Um, that's why this... we were obsessed with, almost naturally we're obsessed with with the space, um, right. and I think we—it's we, almost like second nature to us right now. Yeah, no, no. Understanding, like, we're not here to give out opinions or judge that piece of content. Exactly. What we're trying to do is, if you have, let's say, a million likes, uh, great, we're happy for you. But also, what we try to do is understand what, why, what, why, why do you have so many likes? What, what are you doing? That, yeah, yeah. What is it that you're doing? Why are people? If there are like negative comments on a piece of work that we think is great. Yeah. Why you know why aren't people loving your content? Mm -hmm. Not for sure. Um, future of um, sport content or football content? Um, you, in 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 the context of Bangladesh, I think I think globally, in... I think globally and Bangladesh, if you can say it in two parts. Future of football content, I think, is um, more direct access to players, clubs, etc. I think. Um, Right now, there's still uh, some level of reluctance on, on football clubs to be more open. And uh, there is still that, uh, you know, that almost like introverted mentality, especially with some football clubs. They're, they really are not keen on giving you a lot of access. Some have done great with the Amazon documentary. Um, Man City, for example, I'm not sure how many of you follow their YouTube channel, but it's got great content. You know, interviews with their chairman, you know, from the tunnel camp, the, you know, the, the videos that are that... Uh, that have a lot of traction, but also other stuff like regular interviews and stuff. And I think that is where football content ultimately will go. Football clubs will realize that it's okay to have that oh, that kind of access. It's okay for a football Twitter account to run like the way AS Roma run their account. Uh, you should, if or you that, think their Twitter is, is, is crazy, you should check out their TikTok, man. <laughs> they are on a different level. And the thing is, you know, Astroma was only, uh, I'm sorry, I'm kind of cutting off your, your question, yeah, but, no, no, but go, with, go with Twitter, um, Astroma was the outlier, right? Like they were the only, you know, ones who weren't being too professional and wearing suit and tie, like uh, everybody else was, and they were the funny, funny dudes. On TikTok, every club has followed their model. Like everyone's 
being the Astro on, on, on TikTok. So I, th- I think that's another indication of, of where some of the content's going. Yeah, no, it's almost like, think of it like previously, um, we we thought of corporate CEOs and we thought the only way to dress up was where you had to exactly. wear a suit and a tie. Now, these days, these tech CEOs now are wearing hoodies and t-shirts and that's okay. And I think that's where football content is kind of headed. You know, if, if, if I had to use an analogy mm-hmm. that it's okay to be different, it's okay to have that level of open access. Mm-hmm. It's okay for a player to share, you know, have, it's okay to go inside the training ground because I think that the expectations from football fans has never been this high when it comes to consuming digital content. And they're used to like what they're doing now is is okay, but then people expect a lot more. And because there's always a few clubs that are kind of pushing the envelope mm-hmm. and, and, and taking things to a level that is, you know, like the, like the AS Romas, for example, um, the MLS accounts are really well run, the social media accounts, um, even think of websites, for example. I remember 10 years back, 15 years back, official club websites basically wrote pieces like uh, like the way BTV <laughs> runs these days. Yeah. Uh, you could say nothing ab- against the club. Exactly. No constructive, like it it's was... It's still the same, uh, I would say, to, to, to a degree. But, but, they are, but they are changing, you know, bit, because yeah. I feel that there's a lot more openness now, a lot more logic mm-hmm. being applied, that if, if your team hasn't had a great game... Yeah. What do you expect? You can't really put on this this facade and say that everything's you know, fine. Yeah, you can sugarcoat. So I think that clubs are realizing that who are you? You know, who are you playing with? Everybody understands what you're doing, and the audience is much smarter. And you are falling behind. What you're losing ultimately is is traction. Is this you know people coming to your website? So I think that is one angle over time. Football content, you know, football clubs in particular. We'll, we'll look at second pattern or second trend I will say is you know we've covered that slightly is the return of long form content mm. and and your athletic has been the pioneer but I think a lot of other football websites will will go back to that I think there was this period where you know shorter clips digestible content was you know was trending yeah. but but now I see more and more people because this you've got more now, there's a huge segment of smart football fans who really understand and know the game, and and they would, uh, you know, if Athletic hiked up their prices, I think they would still yeah, have their videos power. as well, isn't it? Like right. FIFA footballs doing like longer explainer videos yeah. and dissecting tactics and things of that sort. So, yeah, so I think those would be the two main patterns that I think football content would would probably be headed towards in the you know, in the near future. Sure. Well, I'll be finally, um, if someone were to start something similar to what we started 10 years ago, um, what are three actionable steps that you can um, advise them on? I think one would be just start. Um, um, and, and let me elaborate on each of the single points um, because a lot of, you know, a lot of people, as I said, they have ideas when, you know, when they're teenagers, but they, when it comes to actually executing, Execution is the game, right? And so you got to execute and then just like us, you're not going to have everything charted out, but just go, you know, you know, start something, get your hands dirty, be prepared to, to, to grind it out. And then eventually you will learn as you go along. I think that's, you, you develop your own book. There's no, you know, there's no single business book that you can read. You develop your own book as you go along and then, then you'll figure out. And if nothing, you know, if nothing works out, at least you have had that great experience and learning experience. So that would be one. Second would be developing and leaning on uh, a strong support mechanism and, and network. Uh, something that we did not do that I covered initially that uh, you're not going to know everything. I think there's always smarter people out there and it's, it does not have to be, you know, you know, formal programs per se, but uh, reaching out to the right people, introducing what you do and then just making sure that you have a strong support network around you so that you're constantly you know if you're going off track for example there's always that that one person at least who calls a spade a spade and will will bring you back to reality because sometimes when people start new initiatives they are uh, they're like overly emotional and then if if you say something that goes against what they believe you you get worked up very easily and I, and I think i'll just add to that you're kind of in the middle of, of the three points but i'll add to that, that i think you were that person for me in a lot of cases i think a lo- i do think on a creative bandwidth and, and a lot of the times i do think from a, a you know i wouldn't say a hyper emotional space but i do think you know uh i'm trying to 
build a vision in my head. A lot of the times I forego a lot of foundational aspects. And I think that's where you kind of bring me down and say, hey, look, these are the things that, that will work. These are the things that won't work. We are short on people, we're short on this, we're short on, we can't do that as much. So I think that's that's very true. And the other aspect you mentioned was the knowing enough people and reaching out to people. I think that collaborative aspect is so, so important. Like Plantic wouldn't be here without collaboration, right? I think just knowing Absolutely. people, the right people, and reaching out to people, even out of reach, you know, like, you know, uh, when we did the 2014 thing, and we reached out to Riyad Bhai, who yeah. didn't, like, we didn't know personally, and now he's still one of our, you know, biggest supporters and mentors, yeah, and yeah. so many other people that you can't think of. I mean, the, the, remember the Andrew Lessie, John Dykes videos? Yeah. Those were like random Twitter messages. Yeah. I saw yeah. saw something on YouTube. I thought it might be worth uh, sending them a message. Don't be scared to reach out, uh, even if it's a cold email. Yeah. But anyway, I'll continue. No, and then the third point is this um, realization and acknowledgement that you don't have all the skill sets that that is required to to run something like this. Yeah. There's always you might have the greatest football brain. You might have you know you might be amazing in tactics. You might be like. Uh, Michael Cox and Zola Marking and then but but there's always going to be something that you don't have and so I think having that humility and and the constant curiosity to learn from other people and uh, just just being ready to form the right kind of team and I think that that you know in essence that's really the whole that's what this whole conversation has been about knowing who to go to finding the right kind of partner and and if you're certain that this is the partnership you know the 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 basics of the partnership are right, stick to it. Don't let your ego kind of get in the way and think that you know more than you really do. Uh, find that right balance because ultimately you won't be able, you might be, you know, when you're in the early years, you might be, you might think that you can devote, you know, 24 seven, the entire, you know, the entirety of your time to to this venture, but eventually you are you are going to, you know, go go back to you to to what you know things were you know in a, in a normal setting, and eventually you would have to lean on other people for support if you if you are to sustain your initiative. So I think that, that finding the right team, knowing and being humble enough to 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 realize that you don't have all the expertise or or all the skill sets. Well, I mean, that was fantastic. I hope uh, we get to do this for the ten years. God knows. Uh, what will things will be like in 2032, but I hope it's uh, it's bigger and better. So thanks for your time. Appreciate it. And um, yeah, if I was there, I would do like a fist bump, but can't do it here. So Yeah, no, 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 no. Thanks for having me. And one final thing, and it's so great to see how far your podcast has, has come along, because I remember back in 2017 or 18, you know, you had shared this rant on one random day that you wanted to, to turn your uh, garage of, the, of your house in, in, in Dhaka to a podcast studio and then from then on you you made it actually happen the following year you invested a lot in a, in a podcast setting and then almost in many ways I know there are like uh, different debates now about you know the the uh, the podcasting scene but in many ways I think you have been the pioneer of the whole sort of podcasting um, landscape in Bangladesh so that kind of I know Different people are, are, you know, calling different kinds of content podcasts, especially since the pandemic. But but when you really analyze it, you know, in, in a neutral manner, what you started doing back, you know, pre-pandemic. You know, I think your 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 first episode was back in Jan 2020. Yeah. That in many ways set the tone for the 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 post-pandemic content and the the types of content that we saw uh, in 2020, 21, and then what that we're seeing now. So. Um, you know, I just wanted to share that that it's been it's been a privilege for me to 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 have been you know to be able to see that journey so closely, and you know I hope that you keep doing this and and keep inspiring people because I always say this that when it comes to all things creative, you are my number one inspiration. I've learned so much from you, not just on the creative front, but also I think from a human being perspective as well. Uh, you know, I've always felt that uh, even though there's not a big age gap between us. When we were young, I was, you know, as I said at the start, I was more emotional, less forgiving. Um, but I always felt that you were like way more mature for your age. And that is, you know, you know, forget the last hour or so of this podcast. That is the main reason why this this sort of co-founder relationship worked. Because you, even though when, when I was not right, when I was clearly wrong, when I thought I knew more than I really did, you were there to, to not just, you know, knock me down or... or you were there to to 
sort of you were that one one individual that one figure who explained to me things in in a in a constructive manner you were always ready for debates conversations and not kind of shut the door and and you know end the relationship altogether so i think that ultimately you know i you, you are one of the you know people that i look up to the most in terms of you know creative things or starting out you know building new things in terms of doing things and you know i hope you you keep this up and and, and you give us great quality content in the you keep yeah, giving us great um, quality content i i will find a way to add that to my cv because uh yeah that's that's a pretty intense <laughs> yeah no but i don't think i think you'll cross one page i know no i will i think i think you kind of covered like after you have to cut that last bit <laughs> <laughs> I do appreciate the words. Um, I knew you mentioned about the pioneering the podcast thing, but honestly, I don't think I would have known podcast if it wasn't for you because Plantic started the podcasting thing in 2012? Yeah, so I used to listen to, um, I don't know if they're still around and that shows how much, how out of touch I am with football. So Guardian has this weekly podcast thing. It's called the Guardian Football I think Weekly. Still and, then, and back then, Back then, there were like there was James Richardson who was hosting it, Barry Glendening, James Horncastle, Rafa Honigstein, and all these football journalists that you know I used to be massive yeah. fans of, and and that was great. You know, I used to listen to it every single week, twice a week. I think back then they were they used to run. So you know, that was for me. Without that, I don't think I would have known what what. Yeah, and then that's the thing, that's the thing about up. networking and knowing the right people, right? Because you brought it on to the to the ecosystem of of Plantic and shared it with us, and then we just jumped straight onto it because it's something first of its kind. And we don't want to talk about being first in Bangladesh. It's a great kind of you know pat on the back, but it, it was quite cool for us to jump into innovative and new things. So doing this okay. pretty much in 2012. Um, set the tone for me to to continue doing so. You know, uh, except back then we didn't have listeners, and these these people we do. did have listeners. Uh, it's a, you know, believe it or not, because I was the one uploading the stuff, and I remember seeing a lot of listeners. But dude, thank you for the kind words. That was uh, very very emotional. Um, that was very good. One hour. Uh, I, I know we talk a lot um, on the phone and stuff, but I think this was uh, this was quite nice to put it on a public yeah. setting. So. Um, Anyway, I'll, I'll catch you soon. Pleasure. Thanks, thanks for having me and then good luck with the rest of the season.